The James Webb Space Telescope is easily one of the most significant and exciting inventions of the 21st century so far. A telescope with the power to look backwards in time to the very earliest days of our universe, using deep infrared imaging to peer through clouds of cosmic dust that obscure the birth of stars and galaxies, the James Webb is our looking glass into the hidden secrets of the universe. Unless it gets hit by a space rock and breaks. More on that in a minute. But assuming the James Webb isn't broken, then we are on the verge of seeing the very first results from this observatory's full array of imaging devices. So far, we've seen one calibration image, which looks amazing, but this is nowhere near what the Webb can actually accomplish. On July 12th, NASA will unveil the first full color images from James Webb, which will be comprised of thousands of exposures from multiple image sensors, all composited into one photograph. NASA won't say what the images will be, but they are promising something spectacular. Then, once the initial fanfare is out of the way, it's time for James Webb to get to work. And one of the most exciting first tasks for this space telescope is to seek out two strange new worlds in a distant solar system and reveal their secrets. These are two super-Earth exoplanets that are believed to host some insane characteristics like blistering hot surface temperatures and even lava rain. It rains lava from the sky. We've got some crazy things to talk about today, so let's get going. This is The Space Race. Some breaking news here as we're trying to make this video, the James Webb Space Telescope has been struck by a meteorite. NASA is just now revealing that the mirror array of the James Webb took a hit from a stray micrometeoroid sometime between May 23rd and 25th. Now, obviously the telescope is situated out in deep space with no protection from the Earth, so it was expected that little bits of rock and debris would inevitably hit the gigantic mirror. But NASA is reporting that this impact came from a larger rock than they had ever anticipated would hit the spacecraft. When we talk about micrometeoroids, we are typically referring to little grains of sand that are flying around in space. And NASA did perform tests and simulations on the James Webb mirror for these kinds of impacts before the telescope was launched. They were confident that the typical meteoroid wouldn't pose any threat to the web. But this one came as a kind of interstellar sucker punch. Usually, the larger space rocks travel in packs. That's why we get meteor showers, and NASA is able to track those showers and maneuver the James Webb in a way to avoid a direct hit from the meteoroids. But that only works if NASA can see them coming. This particular rock that hit James Webb was a renegade, something NASA has referred to as an unavoidable chance event. NASA hasn't even been able to specify exactly how big the rock was that hit Webb, but they did reveal that the strike has caused a marginally detectable effect in the data, and that engineers are continuing to analyze the effects of the impact. So far, scientists are remaining optimistic about the telescope's future, saying Webb's beginning of life performance is still well above expectations, and the observatory is fully capable of performing the science it was designed to achieve, end quote. NASA says that the mission team has already begun the process of adjusting the impacted mirror segment to help cancel out the data distortion, and they can continue to make adjustments over time to get the best results. However, NASA warns that the engineers will not be able to completely cancel out the impact of the strike. So that sucks, but it's not the end of the world, just very disappointing. Anyway, life goes on. NASA doesn't seem to think that the scar from the meteor impact will have any effect on the current schedule for the James Webb. We should still be getting that first image in about a month from now, and the hunt for exoplanets is still on. So let's get into some details on these new super hot super Earths. 
There is a lot to keep you distracted on Earth, and we're only a grain of sand in this universe. There is so much to explore and learn. Luckily, our partner Blinkist helps you discover and understand powerful ideas from books and podcasts in a short amount of time. With over 5,000 titles in 27 different categories to choose from that are under 15 minutes, you'll never run out of options. We've all heard of Carl Sagan, but I had never read this popular book, Cosmos, which shows us the basic concepts behind our understanding of the universe. In Cosmos, we learn that the biggest challenge for humans living on Mars would be the sourcing of water. But if we could melt Mars polar ice caps, then we one day could call ourselves Martians. Blinkist has the perfect content to help you be a better, smarter, and more knowledgeable you in 2022, and is the only app that condenses nonfiction books to give you the key insights so you can apply those lessons right away. What I love best about Blinkist is that you can learn a lot in a short amount of time. It's one of my favorite apps that can provide a ton of amazing value, and we cannot recommend it enough for you to try out. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Click the link in my description to start your free 7-day trial with Blinkist and get 25% off of premium memberships. You can learn a lot in 7 days, so try it out. And now, let's get back to the video. We are literally seeking out strange new worlds with JWST. If we can't send an actual starship out there yet, then this is the next best thing. We can at least get a pretty good idea of what's happening on the surface of these distant exoplanets. First up on the list are two rocky planets about 50 light years away from our own solar system. These are both similar to our own planet in the sense that they are made of rock and do not have giant gaseous atmospheres surrounding them. But both are significantly larger than our Earth, between 1.3 and 2 times the size, hence the term super-Earth. We know that most of the planets in our galaxy are probably around this size, somewhere in the ballpark between the Earth and Neptune. And like most planets in the galaxy, these two super-Earths in question orbit very close to their host stars. One thing that's very important to keep in mind when imagining the greater Milky Way galaxy is that our solar system as we know it is actually very weird. We have a sprawling system of planets that come in a wide variety of sizes and compositions, and all orbiting neatly around one star with plenty of open space in between. We have the small rocky planets on the inside, and giant gas planets on the outside. It seems to all make perfect sense, except that it doesn't. According to our observations so far, most solar systems in the galaxy have a binary star, meaning two suns is more normal than one, and in other solar systems, the planets that orbit the stars are usually all more or less the same size. They don't have a massive variation, and they're usually very close to the host star. There are entire solar systems out there that exist just in the relative space between our sun and the planet Mercury. In some cases, the largest gas giant of the system is the closest planet to the Sun. We call these hot Jupiters, and they were thought to be impossible until we found out that they weren't. And that's where our two super-Earths come in. That's why they're so damn hot, they're pinned right up tight against the star. We'll start with 55 Cancri E. This one orbits its parent star at just 2.4 million kilometers away, which is only 4% of the distance between Mercury and our Sun, and completes one orbit every 18 hours. This planet is about twice the size of the Earth, and thanks to its close proximity to the star, has a surface temperature of about 2700 degrees Celsius. This planet orbits one star of a binary pair that is located about 40 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cancer. There are at least four other planets in the same system. It was originally thought that this planet had a surface of carbon, mostly in the form of diamonds and graphite. But that's since been revised. We're pretty sure now that the surface is mostly oceans of lava, 
And if it turns out that the planet does have a thick atmosphere, then there are likely periods of lava rain during the night. Typically, a planet like this would be tidally locked to its star by the force of gravity, meaning that only one side of the planet would ever be exposed to sunlight and the other would be perpetually dark. And if that were the case, then the hottest area of the planet would be dead center of the exposed side. But observations from NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope suggest the hottest zone of this planet might be slightly offset from the middle, which suggests a day and night cycle. If that's true, then during daytime hours, solid rock would melt to a liquid and even vaporize to form an atmosphere. Then during the evening, that vapor would cool and condense back into a liquid state, also known as lava, and rain down on the surface of the planet. Lava rain. It would be like the same deal as the water cycle on Earth, just with liquefied and vaporized rocks. Two teams of researchers will test these hypotheses. One led by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will use James Webb's near-infrared camera and mid-infrared instrument to examine the planet's thermal emission for signs of an atmosphere while a second team, led by Stockholm University, will use the near-infrared camera to measure heat emittance from the lit side of 55 Cancri E. Then there is the somewhat cooler super-Earth, LHS 3844b. While 55 Cancri E will provide insight into the exotic geology of a world covered in lava, LHS 3844b affords a unique opportunity to analyze the solid rock on an exoplanet's surface. Like 55 Cancri e, LHS 3844b orbits extremely close to its star, completing one revolution in 11 hours. However, because its star is relatively small and cool, the planet is not hot enough for the surface to be molten. As far as we can tell, this planet has no atmosphere at all, which means there will be nothing to obscure the James Webb study of the surface using spectroscopy. We know that different types of rocks emit different spectral reflections. That's why we see them as different colors with our eyes. There are similar differences in the infrared light that rocks give off, and the James Webb can measure that light, which will in turn tell us what kinds of rocks are on the surface of the planet. Researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy will use Webb's mid-infrared instrument to capture the thermal emission spectrum on the day side of LHS 3844b and then compare it to spectra of known rocks like basalt and granite to determine its composition. If the planet is volcanically active, the spectrum could also reveal the presence of trace amounts of volcanic gases. The capabilities of the James Webb will allow us to transform all of these theories and ideas into known facts. It's not like we'll be taking crystal clear photos of the planet's surface. We're still nowhere near being able to do that in spite of what other YouTube channels might lead you to believe. But the James Webb absolutely can measure the infrared light that is being reflected off of these planets, and contained within that light is the list of ingredients that make up the planet's atmosphere and surface. So we can start to get a real idea of just how similar or different these far-off exoplanets are to the Earth and the planets of our own solar system. We know that our place in the galaxy is unique, and that's probably the reason why we are all here today, sitting in front of this insane computer technology that was only made possible by a very particular set of cosmic circumstances. If we can identify that same set of circumstances somewhere else in the greater universe, then we can finally say with certainty that there is another person out there doing the same thing as we are, asking the same questions about us that we are about them. And that's trippy as hell. Anyway, let us know what you think is going on with the James Webb in the comments below. There's a lot right now. Is it broken? What will the first images be taken of? And will it find aliens? 
Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.